Stacey Bjordahl. I'm the hearing examiner for Spokane County, but I am serving as the pro tem for the regular hearing examiner pro tem for the city of Liberty Lake. The hearing examiner is an attorney retained by the city to hear and decide land use applications and appeals and other quasi judicial matters. The hearing examiner's office is independent of the city planning division. My assistant Kimberly McIntyre is acting as the clerk and administering this online meeting today. Please keep in mind during the hearing that we are conducting this via the internet, as you know, and so as a courtesy to the participants in the hearing, please take precautions to avoid any distracting background sounds or background images, and just be aware of what your camera may be showing on the screen. And we thank you for your cooperation. Today's date is Thursday, November 3rd, or excuse me, Thursday, November 2nd, 2023, and the time is approximately 10, 11 a.m. The hearing scheduled to be heard at this time is hearing examiner file number LUA 2023-0009, which is a request by Greenstone Corporation to rezone certain River District HOA properties from RDR and RDM to a new River District Open Space RDO zoning designation. The hearing is being conducted in accordance with the procedure set forth in the Liberty Lake Municipal Code and the hearing examiner system. Today's hearing will generally proceed as follows. We will hear a staff report from city planning staff, and I believe Ms. Key will be presenting that. Then we will hear any reports or comments from any other municipal departments or state agencies that might be participating. Then we will hear from the applicant who has the burden of proof in this matter. And then we will hear public testimony. And I believe the intention, intention is that Ms. McIntyre will call on individuals. And then I will just ask her to say who would be on deck, so to speak, so that you would be prepared to speak when it's your turn. And if you have the ability, please use your video when you are giving your testimony. And I will swear in each person after you state your name and address for the record. And then finally, I want to note that uh, we have re I've reviewed the planning division's application file in this matter and incorporate all the documents in the file as part of the record. The hearing examiner's decision is only a recommendation to the city council. The city council does have the final decision making authority whether or not to approve or deny the rezone request. At this time, I would like to go ahead and turn it over to city planning staff, Ms. Key, for your presentation. Good morning, Madam Hearing Examiner. Uh, Lisa Key, uh, Director of Planning, Engineering, and Building Services for the City of Liberty Lake. And um, our address here at City Hall is 22710 um, East Country Vista Drive, Liberty Lake, Washington, 99019. Okay, and I will go ahead and swear you in because you're essentially going to be an expert witness, so to speak, as the um, planning agency. If you can raise your right hand, please. Confirm the testimony you are going to give in this reasonable matter is the truth. Please say I do. I do. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Key. Thank you. May I share my screen with for my presentation? Yes. Ms. McIntyre, do you need to give her privileges for that? I've already done that. Okay. Thank you. So, um, uh, as uh, Madam Hearing Examiner explained, this is um, a uh, hearing regarding the rezoning of the RDR um, and RDM uh, HOA owned properties in the River District uh, for purposes of um, creating a new zone. Uh, this application also involved a comprehensive plan and River District SAP amendment, as well as um, development regulations. Those are not the subject of today's hearing. Those are all legislative matters. The subject of today's hearing is specifically the rezoning um, of the, the proposed properties. So I'm, I'd like to give you an overview of those properties. Um, first, the RDR zone properties. Um, include Half Moon Park, which is 2.82 acres, Greenway uh, slash Community Farm, 
uh, property, which is 3.94 acres, and River Rock Park, which is 4.92 acres. All are subservient tracks identified as parks, greenways, or common open space in the River District and dedicated to the River Crossing Owners Association for ownership and maintenance in the respective final plats. Uh, we also have um, uh, proposed to be platted, or actually it, it, since the time of preparing this, it has been platted uh, as lot two, block one um, of uh, River District Town Center first edition final plat. Uh, and that is um, the future Centennial Trailhead Park, which is plus or minus 9,600 square feet. Um, city code uh, section 10.4b-5a um, does establish criteria for approval, specifically that such amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan and is not detrimental to the public welfare, that changes in economic, technological, or land use conditions have warranted, uh, have occurred to warrant a uh, modification. It is found that an amendment is necessary to cor correct an error. It is found that an amendment is necessary to clarify meaning or intent. It is found that an amendment is necessary to provide for a use that was not previously addressed or those amendments as deemed necessary by city council as being in the public interest. So again, and I wanna stress this, um, any one of these criteria um, can be a basis for approving uh, the zone change. Um, so here's a procedural summary. Um, uh, Planning Commission uh, docket was approved on May 10th, and we've had um, uh, uh, Planning Commission workshops on the 10th of May, the 14th of uh, June, the 7th or the 12th of July, and the 9th of August. Um, we did do a, uh, we did provide SEPA and public hearing notices for the Planning Commission hearing. Uh, the SEPA comment period and appeal period ended on 8:24. Uh, and it was uh, it was a determination of non-significance. Uh, the uh, planning commission hearing was held on September 13th, and the planning commission did ratify the findings, conclusions, and recommendations on October 11th. Hearing notices were sent um, out um, October 16th through the 20th. And uh, we're having the hearing before the hearing examiner. Uh, we will be scheduling um, the final hearing before city council sometime in December, depending upon when we receive the hearing examiner's recommendations. So it may be the 5th, but probably more likely it will be the 19th to allow adequate, adequate time for noticing. Um, we did receive a uh, significant comments prior to the planning commission hearing a total of 26 public comments had been received at the time of the writing of the staff report for the planning commission and they are contained in appendix e and then f uh prior to the uh, uh, appendix f for those comments that were received prior to the planning commission hearing um but after the staff report there were 24 comments in opposition uh, with commonly cited concerns being noise and odor, unsightly uh, views of the storage containers and farm equipment, lack of screening and buffering from adjacent residential uses, lack of engagement of neighboring property owners and members prior to the development of the HOA uh, or the farm on HOA property and general incompatibility of an active commercial farm adjacent to residential properties. One comment requested additional information and one was a response to comments from the applicant. Uh, and uh, at the time of the writing of the staff report, we had received six additional written comments from B. McDaniel, C. Bell, R. Uh, DeFranzo, J. Evans, K. Johnson, and L. A L. Allen. Uh, those are appended to the staff report as Exhibit I. And uh, we have received three comments since the staff report has been submitted. Those of uh, Bonnie Zerba and, uh, or, or B Zerba and B Burns, uh, D and L Sheehan and Derry Van, Van Dusen. Um, 
And these have been submitted as Exhibit J to the staff report. Um, uh, I sent them to the hearing examiner this morning. Um, relevant comp, comp plan goals. Um, there are quite a few relevant comp plan goals. I'm not going to bore you with the details. Um, they're located on pages 8 and 9 of the staff report. Um, and um, the staff analysis. So, a couple things. Proposed uses included in the proposed uh, zoning regulations are generally uses that are already allowed under existing zoning, except for community events, seasonal and special events, uh, mobile sales and concessions, food trucks, and small scale orchards, vineyards, and community farms that are all listed as limited use. Main differences in the uses allowed um, under this zone. Um, it's been proposed that agricultural product craft sales stand, i.e. a farmer's market, would be allowed on properties currently zoned RDR. It's already allowed in the RDM zone. Uh, and community gardens, farm stands, and market gardens would be outright allowed uses as opposed to limited uses, uh, with proposed definitions to be added to the River District Development Code. Um, under the provisions for use determinations in the zoning matrix, the concept of a cooperative community farm on less than five acres has been interpreted as the equivalent of small scale orchards, vineyards, and community gardens identified in the limited use standards. And while the terminology small scale orchard, vineyard, and community gardens are not defined within the River District SAP, we have uh, deferred to Washington State Department of agriculture's definition of small-scale ag agriculture as farms of less than 10 acres. So differences in the proposed development code um, include identifying primary structures um, in this zone to include picnic shelters, restrooms, playground equipment, water features, vegetable garden beds, farm stands, produce cleaning buildings, shipping containers are expressly identified as an acceptable primary structure. Um, and differences in the proposed development code would increase side yard setback from 0 to 10 feet and rear yard setback from 5 to 10 feet, change maximum lot allowance, uh, lot coverage allowance from 30% down to 10%, adding design standards that include buffering and screening requirements for metal shipping containers and residential uses, um, and uh, Potential uh, comp plan policies that were in conflict with the proposed amendment, um, and these really relate to the development regulations. But again, it's I think it's important to call out um, the basis for planning commission's recommendation. Maintain the urban village character and the scenic resources of the community. Preserve the uh, character of existing neighborhoods and support high quality new development. Encourage developers to work with neighborhoods to develop plans that address neighborhood concerns, such as environmental protection, aesthetics, quality of life, property values, and preservation of open space. Providing for a compatible mix of housing and commercial uses in all commercial districts, neighborhood centers, community centers, and the central business district. And uh, urban design policy number one, maintaining design standards and a design review process to ensure that neighborhoods and community centers are developed with minimal impact on surrounding land uses are consistent with community character and assure pedestrian and vehicle access. Also, um, urban design policy number 19, maintain design standards and land use plans for neighborhood centers, community centers, and the central business district that are based on the following principles. Uh, the, one that's, that the one that's in conflict is C, unsightly views such as heavy machinery, storage areas, loading docks, and parking areas should be screened from the view of adjacent uses and from arterials. And urban design policy 20, maintain specific regulations for de designated aesthetic corridors and boulevards. Um, and uh, specifically um, item D, providing performance standards to adequately screen heavy or manufacturing industrial type developments that have exterior clutter, exterior storage, exterior heavy equipment, exterior fabrication and assembly. So uh, again, I wanna point out that the burden um, on the app, it's a burden on the applicant to demonstrate that if a change in economic, technological or land use conditions occurred to warrant the proposed amendment, 
if the uh, proposed amendment will be compatible with adjacent uses or if the proposed mitigations are sufficient to make the proposed amendments compatible with surrounding land use, that the proposed amendment is not detrimental to the public good and or that the proposed amendment is in the public interest. And um, planning commission uh, findings, uh, they did they did find that the required CEPA review has been completed on the proposed amendment and all public and, and agency notice requirements were met and accomplished in a timely manner. The public was provided the opportunity for early and continuous participation and the public had the opportunity to submit written comments and testify at a public hearing before the planning commission. Uh, the planning com commission um, reached the following conclusions that the proposed amendment is consistent with the comprehensive plan and is not detrimental to the public welfare as based upon proposed modifications to the development regulations and I should point that out. Uh, the proposed amendment is not warranted by a change in economic, technological, and or land use uh, conditions. The proposed amendment is not necessary to cor correct an error. The proposed amendment is necessary to clarify meaning or intent. The proposed amendment is necessary to provide for a proposed use that was not previously addressed. And the proposed amendment is not deemed necessary as being in the public interest. Uh, the planning commission made the following recommendation that uh, uh, with uh, that the that the um, amendments to the uh, comprehensive plan and river district development regulations be approved with modifications, specifically deleting the allowance for storage containers as a primary use and eliminating the design standards proposed for storage containers. And they they deemed that that those changes addressed the inconsistencies with the comprehensive plan. And that's all I have for my presentation. Um, I stand for any questions. Yes, thank you, Ms. Key. And so just to clarify for the record, when you showed the slides for the planning commission recommendations and the conclusions, yes. those findings and conclusions specifically related to the proposed text change to add the river district open space zone is that correct well, they specifically they specifically related to the comprehensive plan amendment and the river district sap amendment the river district sap is is incorporated into the comprehensive plan by reference so, um, so they, they recommended approval for those changes. The modifications were specifically to the development regulations. Yes. Okay. Because the planning commission, they don't have any jurisdiction over the site specific. Rezone request, which we're hearing today is that, that correct? Is, that is correct. But, but, um, it's material to the hearing examiner's case because of course. You can't hit, you can't approve a zone change that would not be consistent with the comprehensive plan. So their recommendation related to that um, is necessary to be forwarded to you for your consideration. And then could you map out the sequence of actions that the city council is going to have to undertake? with all of the proposals that are going to come before it. This is, in my experience, a very unusual request to have a rezone petition before me to a zone that does not exist at this time. And I know that there's different appeal routes in terms of like the growth management hearings board having certain jurisdiction um, or the courts. So how is the city council proposing to take these matters in sequence and, and render a decision? So they will have a hearing first with deliberations. We will not prepare any ordinances until after they have made a decision on this. That's number one. Number two, they would need to recommend Approval for 
the comprehensive plan and river district SAP land use decisions, as well as the zoning decision, and they would have to adopt some or recommend or adopt or approve some form of uh, development regulations for this new zone. And then um, we would then bring for that forward to them in the form of an ordinance. And uh, once it was adopted, the decision could be, it would be appealed to the Superior Court, Spokane County Superior Court. That's how it's laid out in uh, City of Liberty Lake Development Code. And I would agree with you that it, it is an unusual arrangement. And we have had this, um, this is the second time we've had a zone change since I've been here. And it does the code specifically calls out this process because of the quasi judicial elements of a zone change to a specific property or properties. Okay. And now with, and you'll have to correct me if I recall correctly, there's when you're doing new development regulations or amendments there too, is there still the 60 day notice of intent required to be given to the Department of Commerce or Community Development? Yes. And so that has, that has been filed for, this is one of six um, cases on our, our annual comprehensive and development code docket this year. They all have, were submitted to commerce and uh and they have all been received by commerce uh we generally wait until after the planning commission um has acted in order to do that and um and uh this we won't likely be if the if the hearing for this happens on december 19th this won't be adopted until uh january if it is adopted by city council, the ordinance will not. So it's the ordinance date that that uh, we use as the basis for counting back the 60 days. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions right now. Um, and there's no there's no specific site plan associated with this. I didn't see that in the staff report or any of the existing exhibits. So it's essentially just kind of a blanket rezone request. That is correct. All right, I believe we are probably ready to hear. I assume Mr. Frank is going to be giving the applicant's presentation. Mr. Frank, if you would like to proceed. I am giving Mr. Frank um, presentation rights and I need to clarify something for the record. Um, Ms. Uh, Becca Dahl was asking Lisa if you had received her comments that were submitted on October 31st. Um, give me a second and I will, I will look. Yeah, what I have in the previous record was submitted in September. And yeah, her initial comments were in September and then, um, what you just submitted this morning didn't include what she. I believe that was included in the hearing examiner. I think I got it or the, 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 uh, staff report to the hearing examiner. Let me verify. If not, I will submit it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think they were submitted after you sent us the the staff report. This because yeah, the thirty first was Tuesday, and you submitted okay. your staff report last week. So yeah, if you would check on that for me, please. Yes, I absolutely will. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Frank. Um, are you going to share your screen, or do you want me to pull up your presentation? No, I'm not going to share the screen. I don't, I don't see a need to. Okay, um, thank you. The presentation. Um, Madam uh, hearing examiner, my name is Jim Frank. I'm with Greenstone Corporation. Um, <clears throat> our address is uh, 1421 North Medwood Lane, Liberty Lake. And we're the um, developer of a project that's called River District. <clears throat> and the River District project was created by what is a um, unusual uh, process that's available in Liberty Lake um, that's called a specific area plan. 
So Liberty Lake allows specific area plans to be developed as amendments to their comprehensive plan. And the specific area plans allow you to develop your own zoning classifications and your own development regulations to implement those zoning classifications within the specific area plan boundary. And so we did that. In 2008, River District was set up as a specific area plan within the Liberty Lake Comprehensive Plan. And we, we created um, uh, three zones. We created a residential uh, RDR, residential zone, an RDM, mixed use zone, and an RDO, uh, RDC commercial zone. We didn't create a zone classification for open space and parks. The city, the city's uh, development code and the city's zoning code has an open space uh, classification. We, at the time, um, uh, didn't uh, think about it, didn't understand maybe the importance of it at that point in time that the SAP was incorporated. But in any event, an open space classification, a zoning classification wasn't created within the boundary of the SAP. So what we're doing today is we're asking to amend the comprehensive plan <clears throat> and the River District SAP. And so the SAP is an element of the comp plan. So we're amending the SAP to uh, create a new RDO zone designation. And then we're establishing or requesting to establish development regulations specific to that zone classification. And then we're asking that uh, four specific parcels of land within the River District SAP be rezoned from their current zoning, either River District residential or River District um, mixed use to the ozone. So that's, so it's a bit complicated. There's essentially two steps to it. The first is the modification, the comprehensive plan modification, and the, that adopts a new zoning classification and development regulations. And then secondly, it's the actual change of zoning on four parcels of land um, that would be included thus in that new zone classification. <clears throat> So <clears throat> a little bit of the history of the project and why we use the SAP process and what we're trying to do. This is a very large piece of property. It's 650 acres. It's going to be developed over probably what will be a 30 year period of time. Um, we've been developing the project now for 15 years and uh, probably somewhere near around 40 to 50, I mean, 50 to 60% of the projects been developed. The vision for this project was a mixed use, um, walkable community. Those words don't mean very much to people. Um, they're words that I suppose everybody tries to use in one sense or another. But we tried within the, within the SAP and within the narrative that uh, that was part of the SAP plan, tried to describe what that means, and then we tried to incorporate development regulations that would accomplish that. The intent was to have uses mixed at a much finer scale than they are in a typical zoning code. So as you're aware, the history of zoning has been to isolate uses. So there would be single family zones, multifamily zones, commercial zones, industrial zones, and so forth. And they, were, they would be separated from each other. And the only way that you got from one to another was to drive. And uses weren't finely integrated and zoning regulations didn't allow them to be finely integrated. So most single family zones, for example, only allow single family detached houses. They don't allow townhouses. They don't allow 
multifamily buildings within a single residential zone. But we tried to change that. So our residential zone, for example, our river district residential zone allows all of those uses, all of those residential uses. It allows single family detached houses. It allows attached houses. It allows townhouses. It allows small multifamily structures all within the same zone, all located on the same street. It regulates that then it regulates the, there's specific development regulations that Mr. Frank, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I just realized that I didn't swear you in. Oh, if we I'm can sorry. do that. <laughs> sure. If you can raise your right hand. Um, do you swear or affirm the testimony you are going to give in the rezone matter and you have given thus far is the truth? Please say I do. I do. Thank you. I apologize for interrupting. Thank you. <clears throat> so um so we, we developed these zones with the specific intent of, of trying to implement the vision that we had for the community. And, and, and in, the, in the mixed use zone, for example, and the same is true in the residential zone, we allow commercial uses. So um, two blocks away from some of the open space areas that we have, we have a small little retail cluster that's been developed within the RDR zone. And, and in that little retail cluster are a couple of restaurants and a daycare and a coffee shop and ice cream parlor. So the, the, the purpose there is to make sure that retail services that people use on, on, a, on a daily basis and the services that people need are within walking distance of where they live. And so this is kind of a paradigm shift. And you see today the legislature even acting trying to allow a wider range of use in single family zones, for example. And it's something that we are trying to accomplish 15 years ago. And so if a person's looking, for example, for a pristine single family neighborhood where there's large houses on large lots and nothing else in their neighborhood, then this isn't a community for them because this is a community that we're intending to have a wide range of uses, mix at a very fine scale, all within walking distance of where people live. And then we built the infrastructure and the development code regulatory framework, and then the physical infrastructure to accomplish that. So part of that on the open space park and open space side has been to um, develop a wide range of park and open spaces within the project and to um, create a wide range of uses within those spaces. The purpose really, and one of the main focuses of, of having a walkable community is that it really helps develop a social fabric within the neighborhood. It creates opportunities for people to run into their neighbors, meet each other, develop relationships with those around you and strengthen the social fabric and resiliency of the neighborhood. That's something that's really important to us and so we try to accomplish that through not only the, the regulatory framework, but the actual infrastructure that we're building. And so we've, over the years, over the 15 years, built some very significant park open space and um, uh, greenway uh, assets within the community. And they all have a variety of uses and they all uh, try to accomplish a purpose of allowing people to gather, allowing people to have the infrastructure resources to undertake a, a variety of different recreational resources. These are all being managed. They're all owned and managed by the homeowners association. So there's a large homeowners association. They're, they, when we develop these parks and open space areas, they're dedicated catered to the homeowners association. So the homeowners association owns them and then they're responsible uh, for the maintenance of them going forward. Initially, Greenstone had control of the homeowners association through the covenants and we maintain control uh, of the association until a certain number of units have been developed 
and the balance between the land left to develop and the balance of the land that's already been developed reaches the point where under the covenants, the control of the associations go to the homeowners. And so we've reached that, that point a couple of years ago. We reached the point where the developer no longer has sole control over the homeowners association and the residents that are living in the community are on the board of directors and they, they control the association. Associations are difficult. They're, they're very difficult. They're, they're, they're difficult to manage, especially 1 of the size that this 1 will be because. At full build out, this community will probably have 3000 units. And that's going to be in a wide variety of products and a wide variety of demographics, a wide variety of interests. And, and so, um, we worry some about, um, associations being able to, you know, manage that. And we've been involved with associations that kind of, in some ways would all call lose their way because they, because it's complex. And so in order to provide additional protection for the open space areas, because of the, of the magnitude of open spaces that have been created within the community, the understanding of how they're going to be managed long-term and in order to protect them long-term, we decided that while an open space zone wasn't initially included in the SAP and in the development regulations for the community, we felt like now is the time that it's become necessary and important to protect the long-term value and uh, of those assets. And they're significant. And um, the value, just the land value of the, um, of the parks and open spaces that we've developed in, in the ownership of the association is probably in excess of $10 million. So it's significant. And, and so we felt like having specific zone classification for open space and then a specific regulatory framework for that open space would be very beneficial given the growth in the community over the past 15 years and the range of open spaces and uses that have been created within those uh, open space areas um, and the vision that we have for the community in terms of how important those open spaces are. So that's the reason that we've decided to request an amendment to the comprehensive plan and we've um, adopted, um, identified a, uh, a development framework for the open space zone and then um, identified the park spaces and open space areas that would be included in the zone. As time goes on, we expect that additional lands will be rezoned to O as we, what we've done now is we've included those areas that we've, we've already developed or have specific legal boundaries of land that we're going to develop in the parks. But as we develop the, the balance of the community, there will be additional open spaces created. We don't know the exact legal boundary of those parcels that they'll be developed on. So we haven't included those in this rezone application. So we'll add those as time goes on. The, um, the open spaces that we've created, um, in the exhibit that I provided, I, there's some, I described what their purposes are and there's some pictures of them and, and, um, you can see that these are intended to be actively used spaces. Um, and there's a variety of uses take place within them. Um, the, they include, and I'm not going to go over all the, all the park spaces because you have that in the in that staff report outlined where they are. And I provided some information about each 1 of them and, and the pictures of them. 
But when you look at our SAP and the vision and the importance of these open spaces there, um, it's, it's important that, um, that we have that wide range of uses and, and they're really critical to the vision that we have for, for the SAP. Um, the development regulations are intended to limit the uses that are permitted in, in that zone. So the uses that are permitted in the R zone are far more restrictive than those that are permitted in the, um, in the RDR zone or the RDM zone. So they're far more restrictive. And then we've included development regulations that are um, typically more restrictive than and allow less intensive development than you would see in a residential or a mixed use zone. So we've limited the site coverage, for example, we've limited the building height, we've increased the setback standards and so forth. And we've added screening standards and um, uh, for certain kinds of structures and all of those are intended to reflect the, um, the differences between what you would expect to see in an open space zone versus what you would expect to see in a residential zone or a mixed use zone, for example. Those are there to protect the integrity of those assets. That's the purpose of it, to limit the use and to protect the integrity of those assets. So that's the purpose for um, the development regulations that, that we've created. So those development regulations and those uh, and that comprehensive plan that establishes that ozone is we assume going to be uh, acted on by the city council. And uh, there's a recommendation from the planning commission to approve them. And ultimately the city council will act on it. I'm assuming that once the city council's acted on it, then a decision would be made on rezoning these specific parcels to that new zone classification. Um, we've um, we clearly believe that this creation of this zone of an ozone. Um, and the inclusion of these parcels within that zone is clearly consistent with the comprehensive plan. You have to recognize that the city already has an ozone. So the city's already done this in other parts of the city. They've created, they already have an open space and park zone, and they've already um, zoned parcels of land that are owned by the city in, into that zoning. So it's, a little bit difficult to understand how creating a similar zone in the river district would somehow be inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. But um, but anyway, we believe that it's we believe that it's clearly consistent with the comprehensive plan. And I've outlined uh, for you in one of the exhibits that we provided the comp plan provisions that we think are applicable and our reasoning for you know, why those, why we believe those support um, uh, what we're doing here. I think this has all gotten quite confused because there's adjacent neighbors don't like one of the uses. They don't like the use of the community farm on one of the open space and park parcels. And so that's been quite controversial in terms of the local residents there. Zone. It's already in, it's located in RDR zone. It's already a permitted use. So nothing that we do here today is going to change that use. If this rezone is rejected and the comp plan change is rejected, does it make any difference? That use is already a permitted use in that zone. And um, so what 
the zone change is about is not about that. It's about this long-term protection of open spaces within the SAP plan and creating a specific designation for open spaces and a specific regulatory framework for it. And then adding these parcels of land that we've already developed that are already owned by the owners association into that designation. Um, we've, when I say we, Greenstone and the River District Homeowners Association have um, worked cooperatively with everyone in the community uh, regarding all of our open space areas over many years. The Owners Association has a website where all of the information related to the homeowner association assets that they own and the op operating expenses of them and so forth are all, all available on the website for any resident to access. We have regular newsletters that go out to all of the residents. The community farm has a website. The community farm has a newsletter. There's 400 people within the community uh, have signed up for the community farm newsletter. Um, the, uh, we've, we've, we've had many conversations with the people in the neighborhood about, you know, issues, specific issues related to all of our open space areas. And we make every attempt to address those. Um, so it's, um, uh, but it is what it is. You can't necessarily please everyone on every issue. And, um, but despite all of that, uh, we believe that this zone change, um, this comp plan change on the SAP and creating the ozone and then designating these four parcels for uh, open space designation is very important. It's justified by the changes that have taken place in the market, taken place in our own society. And even when you look at things like gardening, it, you know, when, when I grew up, my parents and grandparents and all the people I knew had a garden in their backyard. And, and that's because everybody had a house with a yard. But today, in a project like River District, over half the houses are people that don't have yards. Over half of the houses are, are people that live in a townhouse or some kind of multifamily structure. And, and they don't have a yard to have their own garden. So having community gardening resources available for people is very important. That didn't exist 15 years ago. People didn't think about it, but today they do think about it because the, the framework of our housing and the type of housing we're building is different. And the kind of community resources that we need to support that housing and the kind of recreational and community assets that we need change with, with those changes in housing needs and demographics. And so um, we're, um, uh, so that's the vision that we have. That's a vision that we have for this community, and that's a vision that we're trying to implement. So, with that, I'll conclude. And happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Frank. I don't have any questions right now. I know some of your testimony was, you know, to the broader scope of putting the comp plan amendments and the development regulations, but I think it helped put proper context around how you got to where you are today and essentially creating a, a down zone opportunity because there's fewer allowed uses in this proposed RDO than you would have with the RDR or the RDM and so forth. So I don't have any other questions at this point. Did you have anyone else from your team that was going to present? I know there's substantial documentation and justification in the written materials that I think were prepared by Mr. Terrell. I don't know if he was going to make any presentation or are you just going to conclude at this point if for the applicant? Mike Terrell is our landscape architect and Mike was responsible for um, the design of most of the park and open space within this project over the entire 15 years uh, that we've been here. So he has a really good understanding of what we're trying to do. And I think Mike was gonna make some brief comments. 
Okay, did you want to go ahead and give unmute him, Miss McIntyre? If you want to state your name and address for the record, please, and then I will swear you in. Just a second, I need to unmute him just a moment. Okay, thank you. There you go, Mr. Terrell. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mike Terrell, 1421 North Meadowood Lane. Um, Landscape architect and consultant with Greenstone Corporation. I have just a few additional oh, comments. I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt you and go, if you can raise your right hand, please. Yep. Uh, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are going to give in this rezone is true? Please say I do. I do. Thank you. Please proceed. So, one of the things to to really kind of to reinforce on what Jim has said is that. The area within the river district was at the time of the SAP was not platted. There were no individual lots there. And so the determination really was to create 3 broad zones that could have a broad range of uses in it. And we, we had no had not at that time identified any open space. And so we felt it was important to allow and encourage open space within those zones. And as as time has has come has gone on, we've identified where those parcels are as open space and feel that it's need to be that the, as Jim has meant as noted that those parcels and those HOA um, parks need to be designated as open space to be more consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and development code. And I think that's really a key. One of the key things that that's important to note is that there was a change in land use conditions from 2008 to now because those parcels have been platted and they weren't platted at the time of the SAP. And so that's a key component that we're demonstrating here as well. The other thing is that that those, those uses, those open spaces are not only compatible with adjacent land uses, but they're all, they also should be encouraged and, and celebrated. And things like uh, community gardens and community farms. There are there's a long tradition in many many communities that are well established to having those kind of amazements within the community, and they create the fabric for the community to come together and enjoy events and and really demonstrate where, especially in in creating food opportunities for people, demonstrate how people can grow their own food and come together and and. Kind of minimize the 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 uh, issues with ha with having access to food, and so this is not a new new concept. This is very important, um, not only from a, a house to house or yard to yard, but also within a community. And so, very compatible, and and again, should be encouraged. The next one is that it's not de detrimental to the public good and, and certainly is consistent with the city of Liberty Lake's existing comp plan and the way Liberty Lake is, is dealing with um, open space zones and parks within the portion of Liberty Lake south of, of I-90. Events that happen in, in uh, Pavilion Park, the community gardens in Rocky Hill and events that happen in Rocky Hill as well are consistent with with the goals of the comp plan and in the events and activities that are going on in in the uh, river districts open space, it are also consistent with the comp plan. And we're just saying that it's important to codify those as open space so that it's clear what those uses are, and and lay the groundwork for future open space as well. So this, you know. The view that we have is that this is clearly the proposed amendments clearly in the public interest to clarify that these are open space and they're not uh, a residential zone property or a, a mixed use zone property or a or a commercial property. So we think think that's really important. It's a very important factor in creating community and creating the fabric of community and and clarifying it so everybody understands that these are truly open space areas that have a range of activities that are very important to building community and building uh, strong neighborhoods. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. 
Uh, I don't believe there's anybody else from the applicants team that's going to speak. Do you know Ms. McIntyre? And if not, we will go ahead and turn. I, I don't believe so. Morning. Yeah, I don't okay. believe so. Do you want to just announce the first individual and then who would be called upon sure. next? Sure. Uh, we're going to start with Jay Evans and I'll present for you, um, Ms. Evans, when I um, share my screen. And then following Ms. Evans is Renee DeFranzo. There you go. Should I raise my hand? Oh, is that? Um, nope. You're you're on, and we I'm, can hear, hear you. Okay. <laughs> um, is this hello. what we were going to do next, Miss okay. Franzo? All right. Hello, my name Ms. is Franzo. Pardon, Miss Franzo. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Could you please uh, raise your right hand and be sworn in? This is Miss Evans, I believe. There's several people on the same screen. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Miss Evans, thank you. I thought that there was someone. Yes. Was we are Evans. confused. We don't know who you want to have raise their hand. Who's going to speak? That's okay. Well, if you would like to do it together, we can okay. do that. Okay. Perfect. Why don't both of you? Okay, there I am. Okay. Do you, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are going to give in this rezone application is the truth? Please say I do. I do. I do. Okay, thank you. So, Ms. Evans, if you would like to proceed first and give us your address for the record, too, please. Uh, address is 20135 Glenbrook Avenue. Okay. Hello, my name is Jay Evans and I live in the D River District. There are two nice parks in our neighborhood, Half Moon and River Rock. We live adjacent to the property marked 2A, also called the farm. Area 2 under the Avista power lines was for years green space with a community walking path, but now has been developed to support an agricultural business, the farm. We paid $2,500 more for the property back up to the green space. The extra fee for premium lot with an open vista and nothing built between us and the power line trail. Next slide, please. One day we saw heavy equipment working out back. That was our first indication that the purchase contract terms were being violated. We immediately ran out to see what was happening. Mr. Frank was there and told us that the land was his and the container boxes were going to be placed to his plan. Greenstone shared their plan for area two becoming the farm weeks later at a homeowners meeting. The changes had already been approved by the HOA board. The board was then and still is dominantly made up of the Greenstone directors. We looked to city officers to support River District homeowners, our property values, and to protect the aesthetics of our community. We object to the number of commissions granted to Greenstone without city oversight in the, this new zoning proposal. Next slide, please. In the RDO proposal, section 10.2L7A states, Many of the activities in the RDO zone are primary uses permitted in the zone and are not subject to administrative approval from the city. Given what has transpired with Greenstone still under city oversight, imagine what they would do without oversight. Liberty Lakes attorney state that is it unfortunate that a one year exemption had been given for the River District container box. Now Greenstone wants to make them permanent. Container boxes are prohibited elsewhere in Liberty Lake because they are not aesthetically pleasing. The RDO proposal tries to address this in section 10.2L7C. Screening for container boxes is proposed to be done with permanent evergreen landscaping at least six feet tall. Next slide, please. In our opinion, adding evergreens does not successfully address the site aesthetics issue from our yards or from our community walking path. It does not restore our open vista 
or fix the fan noise pollution. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Evans, and thank you for the PowerPoint. That was very helpful as you gave your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Ms. DeFranzo, you would like to proceed? Yes. Good morning, my name is Renee DeFranzo. My address is 20105 Glenbrook Avenue. The area behind my home is the Powerline Trail Greenway. Its main function is pedestrian and bicycle connection to the Spokane River Trail. In the last few years, Greenway has been transformed into the farm at River District, an agricultural business. This photo shows open space area too today. Behind a stormwater basin are metal shipping containers which have planting beds on both sides. The overall appearance is industrial, agricultural, and does not meet the high aesthetic standard for our city and community. Next slide, slide please. The original vision for the Greenway was more community oriented. It will have pathways and trails, community orchards, benches, water fountains, and trash receptacles, and signage recognizing the cultural and agricultural history of the area. Be available for the community you pick up or products for sales for farmer's market. Next slide, please. How much of the vision was implemented? Not much. There's a doggy poop bag dispenser and one signpost distances to cities and trails. Next slide, please. The picture on the left show shows a view down the residential fences. The agricultural activity is very close to the backyards. The picture on the right shows the huge pile of garden waste dumped up beside the comp community walking path. The public constantly uses this path. The smell, appearance, and noise make a negative impact on public enjoyment. The agricultural business is incompatible with the residential areas. Next slide. The new RDO proposal includes a wider range of permitted activities, mobile food, sales and concessions, espresso stands, stands and more. The table shows what is currently not permitted or permitted on a limited basis in Liberty Lake open space zones all of these items, all of these items become fully permitted if the proposal is approved. These land uses need appropriate city review for infrastructure access and safety features. Next slide. Has the VISTA agreed to allow these expended public uses? Our area is windy, so all high voltage power line safety measures must be followed. A VISTA objects to the metal hoops used in the windrow structure, which is approximately 97 feet long. It creates a sap and underneath the high voltage lines, it creates a safety hazard for the overhead lines. Could the fire department drive its trucks on the narrow walking path? Would a wider paved road be needed? Would fire hydrants be needed? What level of commercial activity growth will mandate adding public restrooms and additional parking? Who, who would pay for these improvements? The city, the land, the owner, HOA, the business owner, where would they be located? For these reasons, I respectfully ask that the rezoning proposal not receive your approval. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, Ms. McIntyre, I think I would like to ask a question of Ms. Key, if I could. Okay, uh, Ms. Key. I'm, I'm not quite sure how to frame the question, Ms. Key, but do you, and, and I hate to put you on the spot, do you know what the zoning designation is of the property owned by the two prior speakers, Ms. Evans and Ms. DeFranco? Are they River District residential? Yes, um, yes, the property is River District residential. That is correct. Okay, and under the proposed development regulations for the RDO. I have not looked at this because it just came up through the testimony. Is there a buffering or screening landscaping requirement between an RDR and an RDO property? There is Do you not. understand my question and what there I'm getting not, at? There's not, there's not. Although, although there was proposed specifically um, screening requirements for storage containers as a primary use. Again, Planning Commission actually struck down uh, the language related to allowing storage containers as a primary use and also um, eliminated this, the, um, the design standards associated therewith. 
that was the modification that they're recommending to city council. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McIntyre, we'll go ahead and resume public testimony if you want to call on the next two. Thank you, Ms. Beardley. Thank you. We'll go with Joy Moore, followed by Betty Zerba. And I believe she's sharing a screen. There she is. You'll need to swear yes. her in. <laughs> okay, thank you. Do, you, do If you can please first initially state your name and address for the record, and then I will swear you in. Okay. Um, Joy Moore, 20153 Glenbrook Avenue. Let okay, raise, raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you are going to give in this rezone application is the truth? If so, please say I do. I do. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. And I'm sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'm echoing some of what my neighbors have said. And I know you don't want us to repeat, but um, we, I just would love for you to keep this residential so that the city will continue to protect us as citizens. We're afraid when it's changed to open zone that um, Mr. Frank would have carte blanche over these areas. We just have been complaining for two years about the containers behind our houses. Um, the city, because of our complaints, the city put out a cease and desist on all containers in the city, which if this stays residential, I believe the container would need to be taken out. And we had that protection from the city. We were able to go to city council. If it's open zone, we're afraid that we won't have any protection as citizens. Um, and we also, you heard one of the, the neighbors say that we paid $2,500 extra because we were told no one would um, build behind us. We were told it was that they could put a, an orchard or community garden. Community garden means that you have little plots which would have been great. That would have encouraged us as a community to come together for us as neighbors to know each other and have our own little garden plots like they do over in the River Rock um, Park. Instead, he put something that is an agricultural industrial business in the um, greenhouse is 900 square feet, which if you call, it is considered industrial size. They are washing and processing vegetables in the container and storing vegetables as part of a business and planning to make more money. If um, you see the um, in July 20th, 23 of the Journal of Business, um, there are plans to expand this industrial agricultural business. Um, and that's what's stated by the grower in the Journal of Business. Um, our other concern is in March of 2022, um, Mr. Frank asked for a zone change in the Meadowood Technology Center. Um, he's stating that he wants mixed use housing, retail and walking paths. A month after this zone change was granted, he sold two of the parcels to another developer to slap up apartment complexes. He did not say when he was asking for the, this zone change that that was what his plan was. Our fear is that something else will be put in that he isn't asking for, and if it's an open zone, we have no recourse to go to the city. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. McIntyre, did you want to announce the next individual? Is it Ms. Serba? I'm unmuting Ms. Serba, yeah. Okay. Ms. Serba? Yes. Can you activate your video, please? I am trying. It's at the bottom center of your screen. It says start That's video. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. And uh, it says, we cannot display your video. Make sure your camera is shared. Oh, that's okay. I apologize. I can't, uh, can't get it to work. Is that okay? Yeah, well, we'll go ahead and proceed. Um, Ms. Serba, if you can please just, this is the hearing examiner speaking. If you could raise your right hand, please. Yes. And uh, be sworn in. Yes. Where or affirm that the testimony you are going to give in the rezone application is the truth? If so, please say I do. I do. 
Okay, and then if you want to continue with giving us your address, please, for the record. My name, sure, my name is Betty Zerba. I live at 20179 Glenbrook Avenue, Liberty Lake. And uh, myself and Bonnie Burns, we live directly behind the large greenhouse and the new 12 foot uh, new storage shed. After several months of hearings with the planning commission and meetings with area residents, I recommend that you disapprove the request from the planning commission to approve Greenstone's request to change the zoning of river districts, four parks and the farm um, uh, from residential to open space. As we have learned, Greenstone's request for this change was primarily to build out the farm as a commercial entity and be able to place buildings and other commercial operations, such as a coffee stand on this large green space to the west of the power lines. The farm is not a community garden, nor is it accessible to residents unless they pay, want to pay $600 for the season for a weekly bag of vegetables. Further changing the zoning to open space for the farm and the three established parks and the planned park would mean Greenstone would have carte blanche to build buildings in these locations, put in a farm or any commercial retail enterprises. There is no need to change the zoning. Greenstones wants this change to open space to take over these parks and the farm to do whatever they want with that land. That's it. The current zoning is working. I appeal to you not to approve the zoning change that can't be undone. The residents will have no voice, no recourse, and no input on what happens to our beautiful community. If you approve this zoning change, I would like you to consider the following rules to be applied and enforced by the city of Liberty Lake. First, we have noise pollution from the refrigerated cargo containers. I'm asking, and this, this is in my written right. testimony, uh, move these refrigerated buildings away from the back of the residence fences to the west, at least 100 feet away from our fences. Number two is farm staff run their automobiles up and down the walking path. I'm suggesting that, that uh, vehicles, motor vehicles are not allowed to run on the walking path. Compost piles are discarded, discarded, rotting, just thrown on the ground. I suggest that farm compost bins be installed on the east side of the walking trail so that we do not smell that. Farm health and safety concerns. If one of the buildings with electrical HVAC catches fire, there, there is not a nearby fire hydrant. And that can be health and safety issues for us residents no, no farther than 50 feet away. New commercial retail operations in the farm or other open spaces, we reject. Do not allow any additional commercial retail operations in open spaces. Do not allow the farm to sell other products such as they do now, such as bread or, or cooking things, whatever, at the farm stand. Maintenance of the farm and parks. Currently, the farm is not op appropriately maintained. There are areas where we can only see weeds, dying grass, and compost thrown on the ground. Require beautification of the farm by planting green grass in areas where only dead grass or weeds grow. And proper maintenance to be ma mandated for the farm to continue to comply with current homeowners, CCNRs, and the City of Liberty Lake standards. I urge you not to approve the zoning change from residential to open space based upon my testimony here and other concerned residents' testimony here today and past testimonies before the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And just for clarification, my role is to only make a recommendation to the City Council. I don't have final authority to approve or deny the requested rezone. That will be up to the City Council. Um, Ms. Thank you. Do you want to call the next individual? 
Yes, we're going with Robin Beckadal and um, Robert Hopkins. They're both in the same room if you'd like to swear them in together. Okay, great. Um, if, if the both of you could please raise your right hand. And do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are going to give in the rezone application is the truth? If so, please say I do. Okay, Ms. Beckendahl, we will start. With I'm not you. sure we have audio. Ms. Beckendahl, could you um, test your audio real quick? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, barely. Uh, let me try something. That's a little better as you speak up. Okay, maybe it might just be me. And You're okay I now. Yeah, thanks. That's much better. Thank you, Ms. Bechtal. If you would also just give us your address for the record before you start your testimony. One, um, 19781 East Indiana Avenue. So you should also have comments now. <laughs> it's my second set of comments. Um, we had some issues, but I think you have them. So I'm on a release on October 11th of 2023, the Liberty Lake Planning Commission, they ratified their decision. One of the things that Joe, Commissioner Joe Mann stated very deliberately and explicitly was the record for a nay, and that he thought that this recommendation would come back to, I'll say haunt them, because this is about if open space was appropriate to allow in as a commercial agricultural. I agree with Commissioner Joe Mann. So the proposed deliberations were really at the PC about allowing 2A, 2B, and 2C, and that's noted as the farm. And please note that you have other sections in here. You have one, three, and four. And number one is where I live by, by Half Moon Park. And this park is an established park. I wrote this in my comments. It's a very established park for stormwater. Now, even during this testimony and during the September 13th testimony PC meeting, the city stated that to currently operate the farm as is, many of the items that are allowed are really allowed with the exception of the storage containers. And the applicant has also reminded us of that. He just did in his previous testimony. So, this don't change really. If you look at how many items on there, it, agricultural, it's all basically agricultural. Very few things are related to the open space as in the Liberty Lake Development Code. The Liberty Lake Development Code does have open space, but please note that it's very, very limited on what can happen in this open space, agricultural. And we can see by the example of what's down the corridor, industrial type structures can go in this open space with absolutely no restrictions. And so these are industrial. I called some greenhouse manufacturers and some people put up poop houses and the size that they are, are more industrial. They're not a little neighborhood type of endeavor structure. So, this has me very concerned and I don't want the existing parks to be developed into any type of a garden, vineyard or orchard. So the written testimony, I think that we have and that I have provided really talks about the importance of Half Moon Park and what it means to people. It's a passive recreation, but it's also really used for stormwater management. Robert Hopkins will talk about that. So one of the things that the city just recently completed a very robust survey for their five year strategic plan. And what did the public like the most about Liberty Lake? One of the top things that floated to the top, they were the parks. These were important to them. They basically, we use these parks for recreation. And it really, I guess, disturbs me and concerns me that this zone change, I don't believe, meets the criteria of the comprehensive plan when you go through those criteria, because there's really no technological change. There's no major or anything on a public interest. And he, the developer or applicant, I'm sorry, he's mentioned several times that he can do this even in his testimony. 
today. And that's hardly with, that's just with limited restrictions. If this gets approved, then it'll be more unlimited restrictions. So with that, I believe that you've received my second set of comments now, and uh, I will not repeat myself. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Ms. McIntyre, I want to inquire a, a question of Ms. Key again, if we could just interrupt before the next speaker. Uh, I know I, I, I'm trying to ascertain if what kind of difference there may be between the existing RDR and the proposed RDO in terms of like size, scale, and bulk of structures. I know in Mr. Frank's testimony, he talked about one of the differences was under the RDR, I believe that had a 30% lot coverage maximum and they were proposing a 10%. Do either of those have, I guess what I would characterize as like, you know, a size scale bulk limitation that would control how large a structure could be either like height or square footage next to some of these residential areas? There, there were some standards proposed related to that also. And uh, in terms of building height, not in terms of building size, it's still all related to, it's all relative to the size of the, the lot. Um, it's uh, based on a percentage, but yeah, there, it did increase setback and it did uh, limit the height. And I want to say um, it did limit the height. I can't recall off the top of my head what the height limitation was, but it, I believe it was less than what the RDR zone does allow. Um, however, um, the other thing I'm going to point out is that um, is that uh, there, as Ms. Bechtel had pointed out, there are more commercial uses that would be allowed, um, although there is some allowance for neighborhood commercial within the RDR zone. It's limited. It, it's very limited in terms of the total uh, square footage. Um, for those types of uses, and they are designed to be small scale. So there's no, there's no proposed sideboards like that in the RDR zone that exist in the existing RDR zone for commercial. Okay, thank you. Ms. McIntyre, did you want to call on the next indi individual and unmute them? Um, Mr. Hopkins, please. And following Mr. Hopkins is Cynthia Garinas. Okay, Mr. Hopkins. Yes, hello. Can you hear us? Great. If you could raise your right hand, please, to be, or did you get sworn in at the same time as Ms. Bechdahl? Um, I, I did, but we can do it. Okay. Yet. All right. Well, do you swear or affirm the testimony you are going to give in this rezone application? Is the truth? If, if so, please say I do. I do. Okay, please give us your address for the record and proceed. Uh, 19781 East Indiana Avenue. Um, I have a couple of comments, one on the Half Moon Park, the drainage um, that is a, a large portion of the park. If uh, the, the developer, if Mr. Franks wants to develop that park into gardens or residential or whatever, He's going to have to move all the drainage that is on there and relocate it in kind in another location, which is going to be next to impossible since most of the area around there is all built up with houses. There's a, a major amount of drainage from not only the road of Myers Road in Indiana around Half Moon Park, but west on Indiana back all the way to Caulfield and south on Hole Boulevard, all the way to Mission Avenue. <clears throat> they go in the underground pipes underneath the park and dump into the, the swales and the drainage structures that are, that are built into that park. It would be very difficult to, <clears throat> excuse me, to develop the majority of that park because of all the drainage located in it. The other comment I have is, the uh, farm to the east of, of Half Moon Park 
has been called by many people as a community garden. This is not a community garden. This is a commercial business, a for-profit commercial business for the benefit of Greenstone and Jim Franks. The only benefit to the, to the landowners is that it gives them a place to purchase vegetables grown in their garden, similar to the farmer's market on Saturday morning over at Liberty Lake. The only difference is there's only one vendor here. So I, I don't think, uh, I'm not an expert on zoning and what's allowed in each zone, but to call this a community garden, similar to what there is in, in uh, uh, Rocky Hill Park and also over in the community of Tratina, this is a commercial business, a for-profit com commercial business. So uh, that concludes my comments. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hopkins. Uh, Ms. McIntyre, who did we have on deck again? Cynthia Godinez. All right, Cynthia, um, if, I'll have you raise your right hand. Um, do you swear or affirm the testimony you are going to give in the rezone application is the truth? If so, please say I do. I do. Okay, and if you can just formally give your name and address for the record, please. Mm -hmm. My name is Cynthia Godinez, and I live at thir uh, 1737 North Myers Court um, in the River District. So I actually don't live near the farm. I live kind of a little bit further away, but I have walked along that pathway. And I remember the first thing um, that I remember about that is that, man, it's really grown. And gosh, is that one heck of a loud fan back there? And I felt really sorry for the people who lived over there. And I didn't know them at the time. One of the benefits of going last is that all of my neighbors have pretty much said the same things that I was going to say. So I don't really have whole much to add here, but there was one thing that I keep thinking about is that as, as it is right now, from what I understand, the farm can continue to run without the zone change. So what is the benefit of the zone change unless you're trying to grow the farm and grow the farm bigger? And so how much bigger are we going to grow this farm? I've talked to some of my neighbors that live over here away from the farm and while the farm like is great, it sounds great to, to want to support a farm and, and have food and produce accessible to neighbors. The heavy machinery, the smells, the group of people coming through. This, I'm not really sure I would want it to grow much bigger than it already is. And that was a opinion that a lot of my other neighbors had felt and we don't even live near the farm. Um, and then one other thing that really, really struck me is that you know, I've heard people make the argument that this is about the shipping containers, but it's not about the shipping containers. Although that's a big thorn, that was a big problem. It's not about the shipping containers. It's about all the other um, impacts that this could this could change. You know, the impacts that this could do for our community here. Um, I I'm not sure I would want to see the other parks continue to grow into more farm with more equipment and more people. You can have, from what I understand, if I got it right, you can have 100 people at an event without a permit, and you could do that how often? In the summer, maybe? You could do that once a week, twice a week? Who knows? Is that, does that work with the original comp plan? Is that what we want in our neighborhood? I don't know if we do or not, but it doesn't seem like it um, that big when we already have the farm. Um, and it competes with the farmer's market. Most people would prefer to go there. So I don't, I don't really see the reason for the zone change unless maybe you're trying to save money on taxes or you're trying to grow the farm. And you can see, what I can see is that most people are already so upset with the farm and how it's been played out. I don't, I don't recommend allowing the farm to grow without some serious community gatherings and really hashing out why we would want to do that and why you would want your neighbors and everybody who lives around the farm to want to have the farm grow. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Ms. McIntyre, do we have other individuals that wished to- We do. 
we do. I'm unmuting um, Betty Zerba, who is uh, or her screen name, but it's Bonnie Burns who would like to testify. Okay, Miss Burns. Yes, I'm sorry, Betty. Oh, oh yeah, hey, I fixed it. it. Leave it to me to okay. fix that. Okay. Bye. Okay. Hi. Good morning, Bonnie Burns. <laughs> Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this rezone application is the truth? If so, please say I do. I do. Okay, I do if you can give us your address for the record, please. 20179 Glenbrook Avenue, directly behind the greenhouse. It's residential property on. We've heard a lot today. I'm not going to repeat it. I'm sure everybody's tired. Um, I wanted to say just one thing that really stood out in my mind on one of the testimonials. A lot of us have lawns. We have big backyards. We can grow our own vegetables. But it was mentioned that there are others in townhouses and apartments here who don't have that luxury of a backyard. And a community farm would give them the opportunity to grow vegetables. No community person here or resident can take a piece of that land and grow a vegetable or a fruit for their own use. This is not our community farm. This is seen more industrial. When he says, nobody next door, I, I am next to town. So they can't wander across with their shovels and their seeds and whatever else. They have no access to this community farm unless they want to pay 150 to $600 for membership fees. This farm is not for our community. It's great if you want to have a farm and service all of Liberty Lake. But I didn't move here into a community to have a farm that's industrial looking and acting. Community farm, great. Let the neighbors plant all they want. Otherwise, this farm is an eyesore. It's a safety hazard. It is full of dirt and dust and does not match the beauty of the community itself. I thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. McIntyre, is there anyone else who was wishing to testify? I need to check in with a couple of people that I didn't get any information from. Um, unmuting Linda and Dennis Sheehan, have you changed your minds about testifying? Uh, no, we're going to let her let her stand. Thank you. And I am unmuting, uh, let's see, I'm looking for the screen name just a moment. Um, Let's see. I've got somebody on the screen by the name of Debbie Dahl. Um, she's currently unmuted, but I don't have her information. Do you want to testify, Ms. Dahl? No, thank you. Thank you. Um, if you could send me your email address via the chat, I'd appreciate it. And then I have um, call in user number four. So if you're on the phone and you're not Mr. Or Ms. Sheehan, could you please identify yourself? Telephone user. Okay, no response. And I think that's it for public testimony. Um, those of you who are online who might want to change your mind about testifying, please use the raise your hand icon at the bottom of the screen um, here within the next couple seconds so we can capture your testimony if you wish to testify. And nobody is raising their hand, so I think we're good to proceed. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask Ms. Key, did you have any responses or comments that you wanted to make relative to any of the testimony you might have heard? No, I do not. Okay, thank you. And then Mr. Frank or Mr. Terrell, did you want to, I, I would just limit it to rebut, rebuttal only, and not any new testimony to any of the comments of the public testimony? Since you do have the burden of proof as the applicant, I'm going to allow just rebuttal only. Mr. Um, Frank, go ahead. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Hearing Examiner, I just have a, a couple of brief ones. Um, 
just to clarify the um, the ownership situation here, because I think there's quite a bit of confusion about um, the farm getting bigger or the farm going to other open space areas and so forth. Once the developer completes the construction and plats the completes the construction of the park and open space and and includes it in a plat. It's then dedicated to the homeowners association. So we no longer own those as a developer, we no longer own those parcels. So Half Moon Park, for example, is owned by the homeowners association. So any future use of that property is dependent on the homeowners association and the developer doesn't have any any control. And at this point, we no longer, two years ago, we lost control of the homeowners association, as I mentioned. So the homeowners association is controlled now by the residents. And there was some misunderstanding from one or two of the comments that somehow we continue to control the owners association. We do not. The owners association controls it. So any use on properties that have already been dedicated to the homeowners association are completely in control of the homeowners association and not the developer. And never do we have any intent of going back onto any developed property and determining or changing it or anything. It's all owned by a separate entity. Um, there will be additional parks and open spaces created as we go along. Um, We'll develop those as we determine they're necessary and beneficial to the community. And once they're done, they're turned over to the homeowners association. Um, the the um, orchards in the in the the community farm greenway the orchards are occupying about an acre and a half the um the gardens are much smaller than that the gardens are occupying about 30,000 square feet there's no intention to increase any of the garden beds again this area is now controlled by the homeowners association so the size of the park can't be increased without the approval of the homeowners association. Um, <clears throat> the um, the um, couple of questions regarding the. Um, the residential development standards for RDR versus RDO. The um, setback requirement in the RDR is zero. So we have a zero setback requirement in the RDR zone. So as it currently exists, we could place a building right on the property line. The, the new zone creates a 10 foot setback requirement. So any, any building um, in the RD, on the RDR, between the RDR and the RDO now would require a 10 foot setback. Um, <clears throat> the height limit, um, in addition to the site coverage standard, there is a height limit that's significantly less. So um, the, Height limit in the RDR zone is 45 feet. And that was intended to allow two and three story townhouses and multifamily structures in that zone. Um, but in the RD in the RDO zone, the height limit I think was 24 feet. It's 20 or 24 feet. I'm sorry, I can't remember exactly what it was right now. And Lisa might be able to look at it, but it's significantly lower. The height limit is significantly lower in the uh, ozone than it is in the uh, in the rdr zone um <clears throat> the retail uses are 
the there, there's no significant retail uses other than um, farmers markets and um, and a coffee shop. And the thing is about um, open space areas, especially because this ozone is not intended only for this this particular piece of property that they're all the uh, comments are on. We also intend to have a a, a, a big plaza in the River District Town Center. That would be open space, and it's a little bit like the Nest Plaza in Kendall Yards, and <clears throat> the ability to have um, a, a coffee shop as part of an open space area in an urban setting is significant. It's it is it's something you see in a lot of places, even in Riverfront Park in Spokane, for example. You see small little retail uses in Riverfront Park. So we want the ability to do. Uh, a small little coffee shop or something in the commercial plaza, uh, if that's if when if and when that's developed, and you see farmers markets located in in uh, parks everywhere, really, you know. But the Spokane Farmers Market market has moved to um, uh, to the um, to the park in Browns Edition, Port Lane Park in Browns Edition is where their home is now, and so. In my view, it's a wonderful addition to neighborhoods to be able to do that. It doesn't mean that they're going to have it in every single park, but the ability to do that in a park within River District is something that significant and we feel important. Um, so those are the reasons that those you know uses are there, but those uses are already permitted in the RDR zone and the RD. M zone already permit those uses. So it's this is not expanding the ability to do those things. It in it's limiting them, but it's not limiting them to zero. So there are still potential to do things, but much more in tune with what opens what would happen in normal open spaces. Um, and um, and I think that's I think that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Um, Ms. McIntyre. Yes, we I had I um, a member of the public raise their hand and would like to make a comment if you want to reopen for public comment. Was did the individual previously testify? No. No. Um, who is the individual? Um, Pat Douglas. Mr. or Mrs. Douglas. What what was Go the ahead, nature you're of the what was the nature of the the comment that you wanted to make? We have heard all of the public testimony and the rebuttal by the applicant. Could you just give me a brief summary of what what you would want to speak to if I were to allow the public testimony to be reopened? Yes, I have a comment on what Frank has just said uh, about the characterization of the HOA, um, um, the directors. Um, uh, Miss Miss that, Douglas, Miss Douglas, that that would be trying to respond or rebut to Mr. Frank's, and so that would not be proper at this time. And I think I could probably understand the gist of, of what you're saying. I understand how HOAs are organized and how they operate through their board of directors and so forth. And so I understand what Mr. Frank was also trying, trying to say as well. And frankly, that's not really germane to the application and what I'm being asked to make a recommendation on today. So I'm not going to allow any further public testimony now that we've taken rebuttal from Mr. Frank, and I apologize for that. I'll uh, address it some other way then. Thank you. And there will be, as you know, this matter is going to be forwarded to the city council who will be taking public testimony. And so you will have another opportunity to bring up any concerns that you have just thought of or of over the course of the next four to six weeks before this goes to the city council for consideration. 
Ms. McIntyre, I think, do you have all the information that you need from all the individuals in terms of name, address, and so forth? Um, I, I do. I've requested an email address from Debbie Dahl, if she could please put that in the comments quickly before we end the hearing. But other than that, I don't need anything else. Okay. Ms. Dahl, if you could do that, that would be appreciated. Use the chat feature in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Okay, and at this time, I am going to formally close the public hearing. And as I indicated in the opening comments, the hearing examiner is asked to make a recommendation to the city council as to the request to rezone the specific properties mentioned. The other matters such as the comprehensive plan amendment and the creation of a new RDO zone, those are under the jurisdiction of a recommendation from the Planning Commission and then ultimately the City Council. I wanna thank everybody for participating through this process. I think it went very efficiently and thank you, Ms. McIntyre, for having everyone ready to uh, present testimony and the testimony was succinct and relative to the rezone and the potential impacts that it could have upon adjoining properties. And I will be taking this matter under advisement and intend on giving a recommendation to the city council in the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. And we are adjourned.